everyone. Welcome to our third session on Christian maturity. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad they're in it. We're making one disciple at a time, learning how to become rooted. And our focus today will be the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we can become rooted by submission. So before we get started, let us pray. Uh, Father God, again, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. We thank you for the special opportunity that we all get to come together this evening, Father God, to continue to examine your word and continue to just understand what it means to become a mature believer. And so, Father, we're just praying that you will grant me clarity and that you will be able to use me and um, for me to be able to teach this session in a way that brings just understanding and inspire us, Father God, most importantly, to become mature. And so, Father, I just pray uh, for everyone that's present here today. I pray for those that are online. I pray for anyone who comes across this teaching, Father God, that this teaching will motivate them, inspire them, and encourage them to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father God, have your way in tonight's session. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I just want to thank y'all to come out this uh, on this beautiful Monday. You know, Mondays are always the best day of the week to, to do these type of events, especially after coming off of a busy weekend. But I really do thank you all for taking your time out to be in person. You know, with the luxury of online, how easy is it for you to just stay back at home and just to grab it online, you know, instead of just coming in person. So I definitely do appreciate you all coming out. So uh, just, just a quick review of what we did the week before last, because this is the third summary, okay? Uh, the third session that we're doing and last uh the the week before last we explained the philosophy of this new program out of ephesians 4 and then we talked about what it means to be a christian we define christian maturity from a biblical perspective what the goal is for every christian we also discussed how to become rooted how it needs to become a lifestyle we talked about what it means to deny yourself we talked about repentance so oftentimes we talk about pick up your cross deny yourself and follow jesus but what does it mean to deny yourself what does it mean to repent so we talked about these things and how we can apply this in our life and then we displayed a roadmap to christian maturity as a new believer what every goal of each believer is supposed to strive in their relationship with god and we did that reflection assessment if you don't have one i think i do have a copy here for you that i can give you after the course all right and then last week we re-emphasized the program philosophy to encourage what retainment Oftentimes, we only retain, what, about 10% of the material that we watch, we see, or we read. So the reason why we're going to continue to go over Ephesians 4 is so it could be embedded in our mind and in our heart. It could be a memory verse, all right? And then we, we talked about the goal of every Christian, how to become rooted in their faith. We reviewed the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, and we explained how a Christian can become rooted in the faith to spark their Christian maturity. We talked about definition, examination, devotion, and application, some heavy stuff. And then we reviewed Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 28. Tracking? And then this week, this is what we're going to be talking about. I'm really excited. I put a lot of time into this teaching uh, this evening. And, you know, we're going to reemphasize the program philosophy again to encourage retainment. We're going to discuss what else a Christian should have faith in. And I put there the gospel message. So when it comes to Christian maturity, we have to truly understand the gospel message, what it means in order for us to grow. If we don't understand the gospel message, then it becomes difficult for us to grow as a mature believer if we don't understand the gospel. And then we're going to discuss the importance of submission as a means to encourage Christian maturity. And I have six components here to submission to Christ to the gospel message, to the discipleship process, to the will of God, to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and to others of the faith. This is going to be amazing. God is good. God is good. All right. And so the program philosophy, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians chapter four. So you can read it for yourselves. Ephesians chapter four. And, and if you don't want to read it for yourselves, you can read it up here on the screen. But I definitely want you to pull out the word. So you become familiar with where this passage comes from. And it says, so Christ 
himself gave the apostles. He gave the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Remember, Jesus said on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So he establishes a certain structure. He appoints certain individuals to fulfill certain offices in the church to equip God's people for works of service. So the outcome of this can be so that the body of Christ may be built up. So this is a word here when it comes to growing and becoming a mature believer, you have to be built up. You have to start at a certain level and you have to continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You have to be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So the goal of Christian maturity is not only individually, but it's also corporately. God wants the church to become mature, a mature body of Christ, a mature church, a mature gathering of like-minded believers in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And as the verse continues on going, it says, then... We will no longer be infants because we're growing. We're being built up. We're going from one stage to another. We will no longer be infants of the faith, tossed back and forth by the ways and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. So how do you know when you become a mature believer is when you come across various doctrines, various uh, theological interpretations that may be inconsistent with the true word of God as a mature believer. Guess what you'll be able to do? You'll be able to use discernment and say, uh-uh, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound consistent with the word of God. And when you're able to discern and you're able to spot what's real and what's false, fool's gold, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you know you're on your way to the path of Christian maturity. But if you're not, then when you get when you come across this fool's gold, it's going to appear like it's the real thing because you don't know which is real and which is false. So this is why this is very important as far as becoming a mature believer, because with the access of information available across various media channels, if you're not able to grow and you're not able to become a mature believer, anything is going to catch you off guard. You're going to be blown here and there. So we have to be careful. Instead, speaking the truth in love. This is what a mature believer does. They speak the truth in love. And then we grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him, Christ, who is the head. That is Christ, as it says in the verse. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Praise the Lord. And we talked about the goal is to mature. And in order to mature as a believer, we have to start at the roots. A lot of people want to start with the leaves and they want to bypass the roof. They want to bypass the trunk and they just want to start spreading fruit automatically. Microwave generation. The goal is to mature from the roots, the roots. And we talked about the parable of the sower. The reason why their seed didn't take root is because they had no root. They weren't mature. Look at this verse here in Colossians 2, 6 through 7. This is, could be a memory verse here when it comes to becoming a mature believer in the command from Paul himself to the church. He says, so then just as you have received Christ as Lord, continue. So in order to become mature, you have to continue in the faith, continue to live your lives in him. What does it say? Rooted. Here go this word. Here we go. Here we go. Rooted. Thank you. Rooted and built up in him. So here go the two words again when it comes to Christian maturity. Rooted and built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught, which you guys are learning today and the past few sessions we've had, and overflowing with thankfulness. So this is a great verse here that talks about uh, how we should mature. And then I have this question here. Where should I start. Where should you start? We already talked about the goal of every believer should be to start at the roots. Amen. Well, again, like we emphasized last week, you have to start with your faith. It starts with what you believe. It starts with who you place your trust in. Big faith starts small. 
Again, it's not a it's not an overnight process. This this is something that will take you time to become built up, become rooted, and become established. When you plant a seed into the ground, it doesn't just automatically sprout into a big tree overnight. It takes time. We just had our our grass seeded. Uh, about a week ago and a, a week and a day and after about three four days I'm already looking at the grass yeah. <laughs> to see if I see any new growth and I didn't see anything yet but this morning when I went out there I started to see the little petals the little green petals starting to sprout up from the ground but it takes time for the grass to become mature you have to water you have to do certain things for it, when it comes to your faith in order to motivate maturity Big faith starts small because you have so little faith. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, uh, verse 20. It says, because you have little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. So it starts with faith in just who Jesus Christ is. We have to start there in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We start there. If we have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you to do. Now, Jesus equates mountains with unbelief. Now, unbelief was a huge mountain during that time where a lot of the Jews were not coming to the faith, were not accepting Jesus Christ as their true Messiah. So it's an analogy that he's using here, but it starts with faith. It starts off with that, okay? And when we talked about faith last week, what does it mean? Belief, assurance, fidelity, conviction, trust, and I love this last word, constancy. Constancy meaning to continue to be constant in the faith. You can't believe one minute and then the next minute you're doubting what you believe. So you have to be constant in the faith, constancy. I love that. What are some beliefs as a Christian uh, we must have faith in? We talked about this last week. This is just a small review. This is providing that continuity and tying what we did last week to this week. This is some things that we must have faith in, that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied in scripture. In order to grow as a mature believer, you have to grow in your belief in who Jesus is. It starts and ends with Jesus Christ and your faith in him, that he is the son of the living God, that Jesus is the incarnate word in the flesh, meaning he became flesh and dwelt among men, that Jesus is God. He's one with the father. This is a stumbling block for many Many other groups and cults out there, they don't believe Jesus to be the son of God. They don't believe him to be the unique son of God. They don't believe him to be God in the flesh. And this is a stumbling block for the Jews and for many Gentiles, for many groups, uh, that Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world, that Jesus is the king who ushered his kingdom of righteousness from heaven. These are some core beliefs that we must have when it comes to our faith. Um, okay, yep, they got it. Perfect. Some other things that my brother pointed out last week as far as what we must have faith in is the resurrection. The resurrection is pivotal. It's foundational. Without belief in the resurrection, you can't be saved. Without the resurrection, your faith is futile. Your faith is in vain. Hello, welcome, welcome. Without faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Whoever would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised them from the dead shall be saved. You can't believe and you can't uh, be a mature believer without a sincere conviction about the resurrection. I don't think we talk a lot about the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection when it comes to our faith. And so what else can a Christian have in the faith to encourage Christian maturity? Let's go. The gospel message. So this is part of this message here on Christian maturity that we're going to focus a little bit on this evening to encourage Christian maturity. You can't grow in, you know, in, in the faith if you don't understand the message of Jesus. So having faith in Jesus, the person, the work of Jesus, but also having faith in what he taught and what he said, his gospel. And so we're gonna have a small review about what the gospel message is, what the gospel is. For some of you, it may be very trivial, but for those that are really trying to grow in their faith, this will be good information for you. Remember in 2 Peter verse one through five, for this reason, 
Okay, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement. So we talked about the, you know, your 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 roots start with your faith. Just start with your faith right here. And then with virtue and with virtue, add knowledge. So in order to grow in the gospel message, you have to grow in the knowledge of God's word. You have to understand the gospel message as it is revealed in scripture. So here go a command that talks about make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge okay so this is what we're doing today this is what the christian maturity class is going to help you increase in the knowledge of god's word as it pertains to the gospel message so what is the gospel real quick two words what's what's the gospel what's the gospel good news and good news good job sister pam for that you get a bottle of water right there in front of you amen <laughs> what is the gospel here we go Listen at this here in Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel, as Sister Pam said, is good news. It also means a reward of good tidings, good tidings of the kingdom of God soon to be set up and subsequently also of Jesus the Messiah the founder of this kingdom. After the death of Christ, the term comprises also the preaching of concerning Jesus Christ as having suffered death on the cross to procure eternal salvation for the men in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel message here defined, but as restored to life and exalted to the right hand of God in heaven, thence to return in majesty to consummate the kingdom of God. So there are various layers here of this gospel message. What Christ did on this earth and what he's going to do at the consummation of all things. We see a lot of this being written in the book of Revelation. So the good news, the gospel is glad tidings of salvation. And, and number two, glad tidings of salvation through Christ. The proclamation of the grace of God manifest and pledged in Christ. The gospel, as the messianic rank of Jesus was proved by his words, his deeds and his death. The narrative of the saints, deeds and death of Jesus Christ came to be called the gospel or glad tidings. Tracking? All right. So not only is this goal meant to be foundational for your faith, but we're also going to get into some uh, some comprehensive definitions and, and terms that will help encourage your overall growth. So it's not going to just be elementary. We're going to mix in some meat in here along the way. How's that sound? So in a nutshell, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ that he saves. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. In order to understand the good news of the gospel, you have to understand its origin and you have to understand the bad news before you could really understand and appreciate the good news. So th there's good news. Why? Because first, there was bad news. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so this is the bad news right here. Many of you already know about Genesis chapter three, everything, God made everything. On the seventh day he rested and he declared everything, what, not good, very good. He gives Adam and Eve a command. Well, he gave Adam the command first. And um, then the, 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 the serpent comes slithering his way into the garden. And instead of believing God at his word, what happens? She believes a distorted version of it, and then one thing leads to another, and this is the bad news right here in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of humanity, also called the doctrine of original sin. Here goes some more bad news right here in a sense, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't know if you guys have ever run across a, a track, a gospel track, it's called the Roman Road, the Roman Road Map or something like that, and it goes through various passages in the book of Romans that ultimately leads to the good news of Jesus Christ. It starts with the bad, but it leads and ends with the good news. So this is bad news, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin, we all sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah. The Lord told Adam what would happen if 
He did not fight if he did not obey him. He said, you will surely die. Then the serpent says, oh, well, did God really say that you will die if you eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil? For the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. Psalm 53, 3. Look, here go another passage here. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And Paul would quote this same verse here in Romans chapter 3. So that's the bad news. There's no one good. There's no one righteous. Everyone has become corrupt. The, the, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things. And, it, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Look, here we go. Romans 3, 11. There's no one that understandeth. There's no one that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. This is the bad news. So we can't appreciate the good news unless we truly understand the bad news. And it's okay for us to dive into why you know, there needs to be good news because of everything that has transpired before Jesus Christ comes into the picture and offers us the gospel. Here we go. Mark 10, 18. And Jesus said unto them, why thou call me good? There is none. Even Jesus duplicates this same message. There is none good but one. And that is God. And we know that Jesus and the Father are one. So what is the good news? Any questions about the bad news? Any questions about the bad news? Uh, I mean, I could just reflect on my own life and say, you know what? This is so true. This is so true. I can't tell you how much bad I've done, not only in my own life, but against God himself. You know, it's that the flesh is inclined towards evil. So this is the good news. And it starts right after the fall. It starts right after the fall. God makes this promise in Genesis 3.15 that I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he's given the pre-gospel right here in the very beginning of Christ, of Jesus Christ, his one and only son, who would be that seed to destroy the work of the enemy. And you shall bruise his heel. Now, this is called a fancy theological term right here on the bottom, the pro, the proto evangelium. That's an actual theological term that we use in um, in academic circles and in, in theology school. All right. That, that means the pre gospel being announced. Here go some. Um, here go the good news as proclaimed and announced in the Old Testament. It says the spirit of the sovereign Lord, Isaiah says, is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So I want to talk about context for a second, because when we think about the bad news, when we think about the context in Isaiah, he's announcing the good news. Why? Because they're in a state or they're going to be in a state of exile. Isaiah during Isaiah time was during the time of the Assyrian. We are uh, a Syrian empire. So we know that the empire has split up into two parts. The, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel, the southern and the northern kingdom, because they disobeyed God and they continue to disobey God. And what happened? God sent the Assyrian empire to initiate or to start his judgment against his own people. So in the context, we understand that Israel is in a particular moral state, a moral condition. And because of that, God still provides hope to the nation that there will be good news. Even in the midst of bad news, even in the midst of your unfaithfulness, God still announces the good news to the nation of Israel. That's the context. And Jesus quotes the same thing in Luke chapter four. He quotes the same, he quotes Isaiah here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to go back here to context. Just like Israel was in a particular condition during Isaiah's time, what was the context during Jesus' time? They were still under subjection to who? The Romans. Why? Because of rebellion, because of unfaithfulness. So they were under someone else's control because they would not obey God. 
And so now Jesus comes during the worst period, if you ask me, of Israel's history during ancient times. Okay, and now he's announcing this good news to them as well. So even, and what I love about this is because we all go through things in our life. We all have affliction. We all have circumstances. But how amazing is God and his faithfulness, his grace, that he still provides hope to his people, even when they are backsliding. God is good. So, again, going back to the question, what is the good news? The more we understand the bad news, the more we can appreciate the gospel message and what Jesus came to do to save us from our sin. Look, by grace. It's by grace because remember, no one is good. There's none that is righteous. We all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. So there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. So God says, you know what? By grace, you are going to be saved through your faith in Christ. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So God knew that we couldn't purchase our own salvation because we all fall short. So God did it himself by sending his one and only son. That's grace. It's unmerited. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God still gave it to us as his free gift for salvation for all of eternity, for those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel. This is the gospel right here. First Corinthians chapter 15. We have to understand the gospel message. We have to have faith in the gospel message. This is how we can become rooted in the faith is by understanding the gospel, the good news. And Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And he has believed and put his faith in that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. So the gospel of Jesus Christ pertains to, part of it pertains to what he did to procure our eternal salvation. This is foundational. If you don't understand the gospel message, you don't understand the person and the work of Jesus Christ, you can't grow in your faith. You have to, you have, it starts with the roots and we're dealing with the roots. All right. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ consists of what? The grace of God, hope of salvation through Christ, redemption from sin, the Messiah's reign of righteousness, the second coming of Jesus Christ, his millennial kingdom and eternal life. These are some components of the gospel message that we must believe. We must have faith and faith is to have a strong Conviction, not a weak conviction, a strong conviction about these things. Oftentimes, I see believers, they have a weak faith, a weak conviction. They're really not sure. But faith is assurance. It's assurance. It's belief. It's a conviction about Jesus and what he provides us. And here go a nice little track here. The gospel is the good news that what? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, as we just said. Um, and it breaks it down here, this little map. You could take a picture of it. Um, this will also be presented online as well. We'll download this video here. Uh, it says, we all have sinned. Sin has a penalty. Jesus paid the penalty. Believe Jesus Christ today for your salvation. So I really love this here. You see, you have the... I got this little this little thing right here. You got the death, burial, and resurrection right here. These are comp these are essential components of the gospel message. This is what Jesus did to procure our salvation. This is amazing. Like I say all the time, and I will and I will I will until the Lord says, "Well done, my good and faithful servant." I will always say, "This is the greatest blessing that God has bestowed on mankind." salvation for men that we can be with the eternal God forever there's no greater blessing than what Jesus did on the cross for our salvation and I will continue to hone on that there's no greater there's no greater blessing no greater benefit eternity with God now I get it it's not enough for some people because eternity with God means that that's something you're gonna get when God says well done my good and faithful servant 
Okay, so that's something that we won't receive in our mortal life. But for some people, it's not enough because they can't see it. They don't know what it looks like. And so we need more than that. But this is why our faith needs to be strong. This conviction needs to be strong about eternal life. And this is why many people struggle with death because they can't see it. They don't know it. They don't really have a strong conviction about eternal life. So when death comes, guess what? We're weak in our faith because we don't trust in the gospel message of what Jesus Christ procured for our salvation. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's eternal gain. So moving right along. Gospel of Jesus Christ. Here we go. We're going into the nitty gritty about the gospel message. God, the Bible states that God created everything, including us. He has authority to tell us how to live. Sin is the rejection of God's authority over us. God is loving and he is righteous. Therefore, God cannot ignore sin and leave the guilty unpunished. And I pulled a lot of these images off, off the web that you know, I, I agreed with that is consistent with God's word. Man, man rejects God and is guilty of sin. Since Adam's sin has corrupted every part of our human existence. All you got to do is look around the world. Look what's going on right now. Our entire being is under sin's power. The penalty of sin is physical and spiritual death. Our final destiny is eternal active judgment in hell if we don't repent of our sin. Christ, Jesus is truly God and truly man. He came to die on the cross as a substitute, the atonement for his people, and to pay sin's penalty. Jesus rose from the dead, assuring us that God's wrath is satisfied. He drank that cup that we deserve to drink. He drank it on our behalf. Sinners can be free. This is the great news right here. Sinners can be free from sin's power and reconciled with God. The fact that I'm free from my sin and from what I did throughout my life, man, that is amazing. I've never felt freer in my life. And you know, I thought when I was captive to sin that I was free. Man, I was, <laughs> I was so held. And think about it, what I used to do to stay there. Think about how much money I spent just to continue on a habit. I spent so much money just to live on the wide road. And I'm thinking in my mind, how deceived was I that I'm sitting here doing whatever it is that I want to do. I'm free. I can make my own decisions. But yet I was in bondage. I was slave. I was captive to my own sin. And the things and the effort that I had to do just to keep up a sinful lifestyle is crazy. But now I'm free, praise the Lord. And I have no desire to go back to that life of slavery. I tasted to see that the Lord is good. All right. And so this last part right here, the gospel of Jesus Christ responds. This is our response. When God gives us his grace and he saves us, our response is to repent, to do a 180, to have a change of mind and to trust in Jesus alone to save from sin and the coming judgment. When we believe in Jesus, all of our sin is placed on Jesus and the perfect life Jesus lived is credited to us. His righteousness is credited, to, credited on our behalf. So we can stand before a holy God justification. We're justified by his will. We're made righteous as if we did not commit a single sin. That is amazing. Like you mean to tell me, you, you mean to tell me, God, that I can stand before you as if I never committed a single sin because I placed my faith in Jesus Christ? Wow. Like only God has that type of power to do such a thing. And you can examine all the other religions in the world. There's no God that would die on behalf of sinners. None. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. There's no other religion that offers that type of hope, that type of salvation. I'm sorry. Jesus lived, uh, Jesus lived is, is credit to us. His life is credit to us. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone. This is the gospel message. Every Christian must have faith in Christ. And that's a strong faith, not a weak faith, a strong faith. He's the only person in all of human history to walk the valley of the shadow of death and to defeat it. 
He defeated the cross. He defeated the nails. He defeated those. He defeated Satan and 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 dismantled his his power, his army, by what he did on the on the cross. It says every Christian must believe the gospel message. If you don't believe the gospel message, you don't even know what the gospel contains. If you if somebody asks you when you go out there, hey, what is the gospel? If you can't even answer that simple question, can you can you be a mature believer? If you can't answer the basic fundamental questions of what you believe, who is Jesus Christ? Who do you say that I am? If somebody asks you what you know, if you if someone asks you, hey, how do you know that you're saved? Well, how do you know that you're saved? These are good, these are questions we have to know if we want to be mature. We must grow in the knowledge of the gospel message. And this last point here, must submit. Every Christian must submit to Christ in faith and his gospel in order to mature in the faith. Now we're going into the next segment of tonight's lesson here when it comes to how do we submit. Now submission to Christ and to his message can be a very difficult thing for the flesh to do. This is why we must keep in step with the spirit because the flesh on its own is not going to submit because they don't want to. Huh? <laughs> we don't like to submit. The flesh doesn't like authority, does it? It doesn't like to be told what to do. Oh, hey, look, I'm a witness. Look, the military got me out of that mindset real quick. Oh, you got a problem with authority. Oh, we got something special for you. Yeah, I was in for a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so submit, submit therefore to God. James chapter four through seven, submit. This is a huge key. If you really wanna grow in your faith, you wanna be established and rooted, you want to you know, grow and become a mature believer, you wanna be built up, you have to submit therefore to God. And so this word submit, Oh, um, and we, we're giving you the definition so you can understand what it means to submit, to arrange under, to be subordinate, to subject or to be put in subjection, to subject oneself, to obey, obey, to submit to someone else's control. This is what it means to submit. I love this, this, this definition here, to yield to one's admonition or advice. This admonition or advice would be what? The gospel of Jesus Christ and what he said. And next week we'll go into some things that we must be obedient to when it comes to the gospel message. We'll point out some specific commands, the new command, the great command. We'll talk about some of these things and to obey, to be subject to. I love what it says uh, down here. This additional information, it says this word was a Greek military term, meaning to arrange troops, divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. So how does that apply to us? God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, he, he's our God. He's our leader. He's our commander in chief. And we submit ourselves to him, his authority, his will and his message, his word. In non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude. A voluntary attitude. When you submit, you're volunteering yourself. You're not being forced. You're, you're volunteering yourself to submit to the word of God, to the gospel message. A voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. And again, that's in a non-military sense, okay? We cast all of our burdens on the cross, on the Lord, all of our anxieties, all right? Here we go. Uh, and I, I wanted to pull up this English dictionary too so we can get a comprehensive outlook on what it means to submit. Accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. Are you guys submitting to the Lord? Subject to a particular process. I love that because the second component of what we need to submit to, what did I say? The discipleship process. So we have to submit, we have to yield to discipleship. Think about it, the disciples had to yield to Jesus for how long? Three years, 
three years before they could be commissioned to go to their fort, before they received power from on high in the upper room. They had to sit under the tutelage of Jesus Christ for three years to learn his ways, to understand the gospel message. So there is a process, three year process. You know, in some ministries, you can't become a minister for about three years. Because they take that out of the gospel and how long the disciples had to wait in order to be ordained as a minister. And then it says here, uh, present to a person or body for consideration or, or judgment. So I just wanted to share this English version of the definition of submission. All right. And what must a Christian submit to? Well, I'm glad y'all asked that question. I know it's getting late. It's getting late. And I have six components here, but I'm going to breeze through these. All right. And then we're going to close out. We're going to pray. Okay. But I really want you guys to pay attention to these six components of what a Christian must submit to in order to encourage Christian maturity. One, again, the first two are going to be somewhat of a review because we've already talked about these. Submit to God the Father through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. We have to submit to that. We have to submit to Jesus. It starts to look, you are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts there by yielding to Christ, yielding to him and what he did. OK, um, look at this here in the transfiguration. And you have your uh, Bibles here in Matthew chapter 17, a beautiful account. I'm only going to uh, cite the verse five here. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son. This is the father speaking whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. So in order to listen to him, what do we have to do? We have to yield to him. We have to obey him. We have to submit to him. The father is telling and every and anyone that was present during that time. Basically, listen to him. This is my son. This is my son. Who am I? Well, please, you have to submit to him. He is the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to me except through him. So this is just a verse to prove that we have to submit to Christ. All right. Look at this. For it is a time for judgment to begin. Let me see here. I, I don't want to go ahead of myself. The gospel message. So. I'm going ahead of myself, but to submit to the gospel message of Christ. Okay. Submit to the gospel message of Christ. And now I'm going to go back here. And I meant to put this verse up after that, but first Peter chapter four, 17, it says, for there's a time for the judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will it be for the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So when it comes to submission, we're submitting to Christ. Two, we're submitting to the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this submission, and I love this, this, the ultimate example of submission that I have outlined for you all this evening. And it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate example. At the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the perfect example of submission to the Father. And this is something that I can pray I can do better in. And it says, and going a little further in Matthew 26, 39, he fell on his face and he prayed. This is so key to submitting to God is getting on your. To him. And this is what his prayer was. My father, if it is possible, let this come. we all have a cup we need to drink. We all got a cup to drink. Jesus even says, yeah, you got a cup, you're going to drink all right. We all got a cup to drink. And Jesus had the ultimate cup to drink, which was the wrath of God for sin. And he says, let this cup pass from me. But don't, don't miss this last part. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus even had to submit to the will of the Father to offer his life as an atoning sacrifice for the life of man for the sin of mankind. He had to submit to that. He had to submit to drink the, uh, the cup of God's wrath. He had to submit to the cross. He had to submit to human authority. He had to submit and he did that not for himself. He did that because God so loved the world.
So he submitted. This is perfect submission. This is what we should be praying. Father, help me to submit, not to my will, not to my plans, my desires. Help me to submit to yours. Replace my flesh with your spirit. Replace my desires with your desires. Replace my will with your will. That's not an easy thing to do. Because oftentimes when we don't hear God immediately, what do we do? We submit to ourselves and we do what we feel like we need to do. And we're not patient. We don't wait on God. Easier said than done. Jesus prayed three times alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. Constant prayer. Constant submission. Volunteering your life and asking God, not my will, but yours be done. I'm like, as I'm teaching, like Darius said on, on Sunday, as I'm teaching, I'm also learning. I'm also learning. So we want to talk about how to submit. Well, it starts with prayer. It starts with volunteering yourself. It starts by duplicating this example of the Lord Jesus Christ that he provides right here in the gospel. All right. We talked about number two, submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here go another verse here, 2 Thessalonians 1.8. And flaming fire. This is in regards to judgment and punishment for those who don't believe the gospel. Vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are consequences, unfortunately, for those that don't believe the gospel. Think about what Jesus did on the cross. You don't accept his sacrifice and what he did for your sin. There's consequences for not obeying that. Because guess what? Jesus is the unique son of God. God provided his one and only son. You reject him, you reject God himself. And if you don't obey the gospel, then guess what? There's consequences. We could talk a little bit about that, but you know what? Maybe a next lesson, or we'll talk about hell, and fire, breath, and all that other good stuff that y'all like to talk about, all right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number three. Number three, submit to the process of discipleship. We talked about that. Submit to the process of discipleship. It is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Like Paul says, you have to go into strict training. You have to train yourself. You have to do what you guys are doing tonight. I, you know, you could have been anywhere tonight, but you decided to be right here at the Christian Resource Center learning how to grow. You have to submit. You have to train. You have to discipline yourself. Can't be a disciple who lacks discipline. One of the fruit of the spirit is what? Self-control. Have to discipline yourself. You have to prioritize the faith. You have to submit. Remember when we were on the ride road, we used to plan our day living for ourselves. Now that we're on the narrow road, we plan our day living for God. Submitting to the discipleship process. Now prioritizing ministry, prioritizing the training that each, every one of us have to go through in order to continue to mature in the faith. It is a lifelong journey. Like I said in the first session, discipleship, being a Christian is a lifestyle. So I had to retrain myself from what I was doing on a wide road. I had to train myself. And the only way to train yourself is to submit to the gospel, submit to the discipleship process, okay? Here we go. Uh, and I use this verse here just to highlight this discipleship process that is daily. Whoever would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, what? Daily, every day, and follow Jesus. The one day you decide not to submit, not to obey, not to follow Jesus be the day that the enemy will come in. Yes. Seek, kill, and destroy. Look, we have so many examples right now of ministers and pastors leading churches today that fail to apply this one passage. And the one day, you could be 30, 40 years strong in the game. And on year 40, day one, if you don't apply this verse here, guess who's waiting? The enemy is waiting for you to slip up and to have that one day where you not where you don't have your armor on. And it's tragic. 
because we're not emphasizing the discipleship process that we need to pick up this cross every single day. Not one day can we just say, I'm going to take off from following Jesus. You can't because then the enemy is waiting for you. Think about it. Um, Haman wanted to destroy the Jews in the account of Esther instantly. But he says, you know what? I'm going to wait. So even in the story of Esther, we find insight into the spiritual battle. The enemy is a patient enemy. He'll, he, he'll wait 40 years and one day, if he knows that in 40 years and one day, you're going to slip up, not have your armor on, and then he could come and see, kill, and destroy. He'll wait. He'll wait for an opportune time. So in order to grow in your in your faith, in your relationship with God, you have to constantly discipline yourself. Say no, as the Bible says, to all ungodliness. He gives us the power and the ability to do so through the Holy Spirit. So we have to submit to the discipleship process, okay? Any questions? Before we move on to the last few examples here, we have to submit to the will of God. The will of God. And I've quoted these verses many a times before, but we have to submit and we really have to meditate on this verse here that talks about the will of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3, and I know there's a lot of scribble scrabble here, but if you have your Bibles, I want you to read it for yourself. Oftentimes I see, I hear Christians, what is, how, what is the will of God? It specifies it right here in the Bible what the will of God is for every single believer. This is not just for pastors, for ministers, for those who hold a certain office or have a special role in the church. No, this is for the church in general. The philosophy in Ephesians 4 was for the church in general, that we all should grow, that we all should be built up. So, to, so, so this submission that I'm talking about, the will of God is right here, for this is the will of God. It cannot be more clear or specified than this verse right here. Your sanctification. Sanctified. That's the will of God. To be sanctified. To be set apart. To be holy. Without holiness, no one can enter the kingdom of God. So this is priority. That you be set apart. That you be sanctified. This is God's will for every believer. That you, and, and then Paul just doesn't just say you're sanctified, but he tells you how you could be set apart and how you could be sanctified, that you should abstain. Sexual, immor sexual immorality, unfortunately, is a plague on humanity. It is, and the enemy is using so many devices to lure and to deceive God's people into succumbing to their own flesh. We see ministers from the pulpit engaged in sexual immorality. Unfortunately, this is huge. And then people like, like, well, we need to stop talking about sin. <laughs> well, you see what's going on around the world, what's going on in the pulpit. We cannot minimize the devastating consequences of sin. That you abstain from sexual, and then it says that each of you know how to take his own vessel, his own body in holiness and honor. That you learn how to practice self-control and your whole body, your, your tongue, what you do with your hands, your feet, what you do with your own body, not in the passion of desire like the Gentiles who don't know God, who don't know God. How the world is out there living for themselves and doing whatever they want to do under the sun, committing all kind of sin against their own body. Believers are not to live like the world. And it says that no one transgresses. Here we go. Sanctify. This is the will of God. We must submit to this. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things. As we told you before him and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity. He's called us to a pure, holy life. But in holiness. Therefore, whoever sets himself against this... Whoever doesn't submit to this will of God, according to scripture, sets himself not against man, but against God. So here go the consequences right here. If you don't submit to the will of God and you're not obedient to his will, you're not setting yourself up against man. You're now in direct disobedience to God who gives, and look at this, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So look at what God is giving you. 
He's giving you Jesus. He's giving you grace. And now he's giving you your holy, the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you. So this is why it's so important to be submissive to the will of God and be careful what you do with your own body. Because the Holy Spirit is now in you. Praise the Lord. That he gives us his spirit. So this is why we have to be careful what we do, what we say. Pick up that cross every single day. Even when you don't feel like it. You know what, Lord, I need your spirit right now. Help me, Father God. Submit in prayer, not my will, your will. We're, we're being taught right now what it means to submit. There are going to be days you're not going to feel like doing it. This is where you have to volunteer yourself. You have to submit. You have to pray without ceasing. Because the enemy is waiting for one moment you slip up. He's right around the corner. Sanctification. To separate from profane things. And dedicate yourself to God. <clears throat> to purify by expiation. Free from the guilt of sin. To purify internally by renewing of the soul. This is the Strong's Concordance on what it means to be sanctified. What is sanctification? You got it right here. Look, I'm, I, I'm giving you some catechisms today. Everybody excited about some catechism? What, what's a catechism? <laughs> it's like a teaching. It's a teaching. All right, Westminster. Uh, and we have the catechism is a bunch of answers, a bunch of questions, and underneath the question is an answer. Catechism. What is sanctification? Here's the answer. Sanctification is the work of God's grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die on the sin and live unto righteousness. That's sanctification. The larger catechism here, what is sanctification? Question 75, it says sanctification is a work of God's grace, whereby they whom God have before the foundation of the world chosen to be, you were, listen folks, you were chosen not to be impure. You were chosen to be holy. Holy are in time through the powerful operation of the spirit, applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them. Renewed in their whole man after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life and all saving graces, but into their hearts. And those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened as they more and more die unto sin and rise unto the newness of life. Amen. And you're going to get a little substance here in this foundational class here. That's the only way you can move from one stage to another. I can't continue to give you baby milk the whole entire time. How are you going to grow? You need a little substance. You need a little catechisms here every now and then, okay? <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. I was so happy to uh, find that. Day. I said, oh, this is good. This is good. Um, so now, five, submit to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Look, everything that we were talking about up to this point, if you don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, you're not going to be obedient to all of everything that I just said. So we have to submit. We have to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit that now dwells inside of us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Remember, in Acts 2.38, after Peter preaches his first message, the Spirit is cutting them at the heart. And then they ask, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And what? It doesn't say uh, you will receive the Holy Spirit at a certain point. No, when you do this, you will receive. You will. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive it. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we need the Holy Spirit to move forward and to be obedient, to submit to the will of God. We can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Here we go. All right. Um, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 15 through 16, if you love me, you will do as I command. Then I will ask the father to send you the Holy Spirit who will help you and always be with you. This is good news that he doesn't leave us as orphans. He doesn't leave us on an island by, her, by, by ourselves, but he sends us the precious Holy Spirit to help us and to always be with us. But if we're not yielding, if we're not submitting, if we're not praying, if we're not volunteering ourselves to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit to submit to the will of God. Wow. See where I'm going? Yeah. Okay. 
Look what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 through 16. But I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Submitting to the Holy Spirit means you keep in step with the spirit. You walk by the spirit. You understand the gospel message. You understand what characteristics you are supposed to bear as a believer. The Holy Spirit, real quick, for some that don't know, we have to understand who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the triune God. We're not going to talk about the Trinity here today, but the doctrine of the Trinity kind of describes the triune God. It's a person. He's a person. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. He's not a feeling. He's not a force. He's not an idea. He's not a movement. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is God. I, I just feel like at times we reference the Holy Spirit in a way that doesn't respect or revere who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God. So if I'm going to sit here and say something that is from the whole, I have to be absolutely sure without a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit is the one that told me this or told me that. If I'm not 100% certain, I'm not just going to loosely claim the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. We see what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They lied. And what happened? Okay, so the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. And we have to revere him as God. His intellect, emotions, and will, his functions, including teaching, praying, testifying, convicting, and guiding, his relationship, he can be obeyed, greed, blasphemed, resistant, and lied to. These are things you don't do to a force or to emotion. These are things you do to a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. Yes. If it's not a feeling, how how do you feel convicted? How do you feel emotions? Well, it's it's when it comes to the conviction, the conviction will. And I'm not saying, and and this is not saying that you won't be convicted of the feeling of guilt about a sin. It's saying that the Holy Spirit is not an emotion in itself. He's not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. A lot of times people think that whatever feelings you have or whatever, boom, that's the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is a person who convicts your heart about sin. He's basically telling you in your heart, look, repent from this or hey, don't do this or hey, don't do that. He's telling you the truth. He's convicting your heart about something. Feeling of guilt, though? When it comes to sin. Yes, absolutely. So that's an emotion. Right. But the Holy Spirit is not an emotion. The guilt that you're experiencing is an emotion, but the Holy Spirit is not an emotion. You feel that emotion because of your guilt and your sin, but the Holy Spirit is not an emotion himself. He's a person that convicts you of your sin that now brings about the emotion of guilt. So that emotion is from the guilt of your own sin. All right, so we just wanna make sure we clarify that the Holy Spirit is God, he's a person. So, so we're not going to be led by emotion. Absolutely. 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 I see but a lot of times. Led by the spirit, which is. A person. A, a person. Not, not yeah. What you're saying in that reference. Yeah. But what I'm saying is when you say it's not a feeling, you do feel convicted in your sin. You do feel emotion in being convicted by the Holy Spirit. Right. That's still different from saying the Holy Spirit is an emotion. Right. So, so again, the consequence or the result or the outcome of the pricking of the Holy Spirit will spawn that emotion of guilt for sin. But that's different from saying that the Holy Spirit is an emotion. No, he's the person that's convicting you in your heart of your sin. And once you uh, feel that conviction, you know, that, 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 that guilt, all right, then our response should be to repent. Okay. So again, it's just clarifying who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is a person. A person, just like the Father is a person, just like Jesus Christ is a person. Tracking? He's not an abstract force. He's God. He's God. And these are 33 things. And, you know, I'm not going to go over every single one. You guys can take a picture of it on the screen. You can Google this for yourself. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. This is why he's a person. 
So he's not just, you know, convicting you about sin. He's also here to help you. He's also here to remind you. He's also here to teach you. He's also here to testify of Jesus Christ. He's also here to comfort you. So these are things that the person of the spirit does. Just like Jesus, you know, the person, the son of God came to offer his life on the cross. He did certain things. This is what the spirit, who is God, who is a person, came to do. So these are the characteristics of the spirit. And, there, and all of these are, are pretty much backed up with other verses of scripture that you can take and you can go back and meditate on those verses um, themselves, okay? And now moving on to the last one, when it comes to, yes, ma'am. Could you please put that back up there for me just one second? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. You can go behind you and get you a better picture. Oh. oh. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. And again, I will have these uh, slides for you available. Uh, if anyone wants me to message them, this is all free. You know, I don't, there's no copyright on any of this material here. Anyone that wants to grow, we, we definitely encourage you to grow. All right. Um, now moving on to the last one, and I'm, I'm running a little behind. Uh, submit to others of the faith. Uh, this is just as critical as all the other ones that we talked about when it comes to submission, when it comes to maturity, when it comes to being rooted and established, you have to submit to others of the faith, of the faith, not to anybody, but of the faith. Look at this verse here, 1 Peter 5, 5, likewise, and I, I like the KJV version here, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So those that are, so those that are younger, you know, if you're trying to get to a certain level in your faith, you have to yoke yourselves with someone that is you know, a mature believer for the younger ones, uh, for those that are elders, submitting to other elders, submitting to others that are, you know, uh, maybe equivalent of where you are in the faith. You have to submit to others. Yes. I was telling um, First Lady and I was telling the prophetess too, a lot of people, because I'm 53 years old, and I'm older than I, um, half, if not all of the people that are leading leadership over me. I was 54 in November, but I don't have a problem being submissive now that I know the truth because it's not really being submissive. It really, maturity does have to do, in, in, in the spiritual sense, has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with your growth in Christ. Absolutely. And I don't have any problem with, right. even though the elders and, and first lady and bishop and prophets Y'all are younger than me. Some of y'all old, younger than enough to be my children. Because I have a son that's 37. But I don't, I'm just saying this to say this. I don't have a problem with being submissive because I understand that I'm not being submissive so much to the person, but the spiritual, the spiritual being the Holy Spirit inside of each and every one of you that's in authority over me. And I think you were talking about that earlier about being submissive under authority and those that God put and rule over you, you shouldn't have a problem with doing so if you're truly seeking out God. It shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be a yeah. problem. Age does have nothing to do with it. It's all about maturity and God put people in place Thank you. To, yeah. to, to, you know, yeah, to have authority and rule over you, especially as you come into Christ and you really don't know much. You yeah. know, you have to come under some type of authority because I remember when I was out in the world, I had issues with, like you did, Bishop, when you was out there. Yeah. I had issues with authority too. That I was in detention school when I was young, all of that stuff. I had problems and issues with authority, but once I gave my life over to Christ, I submitted all of that and came under the authority of Christ. And that means coming unto the authority of you, First Lady, Elder, uh, Deacon, Prophetess. I don't have a problem with doing it. Thank you, Sister Dean. I appreciate your comments there. And yes, you know, one thing about submission and what we talked about in regards to growing in the faith is just being submissive to one another. And it's not really saying we have to rule over one another or you're submitting to someone else's rule. There's no submitting in a sense to help each other be right. accountable to God and to the faith and to the gospel message. Look, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility for God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Here we go right here, accountability. 
So submitting to others is more a sense you're submitting so then this way people can help you and encourage you and to hold you accountable when it comes to your relationship with God, when it comes to your walk, this discipleship process, growing in the faith, being built up. Again, your circle matters. Your circle of influences matter. Uh, Paul said, and I think you spoke about it on Sunday, be careful who you yoke yourself with. We're not to yoke ourselves with unbelievers who, especially those who claim to be in Christ, but yet living contrary to the faith. So your circle of influences matter. Accountability matters. This is what this means. And the, um, and the outcome, last couple slides. What is the outcome when you submit to these critical components of the Christian faith? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Here we go. You will bear fruit that will last. So this is the importance of why we need to submit to Christ, submit to the gospel message, submit to the discipleship process, submit to the will of God, submit to the precious Holy Spirit, and submit submit to others who are living according to the gospel message. When we do these things and when we when we go into strict training and we apply this word into our life, when we devote ourselves, we will bear fruit that will last. Now that fruit is not gonna happen overnight. It's going to be a process. Like my grass is not gonna grow overnight to be this tall. It's gotta go through this process. You gotta go through a process as well in order to become a mature believer. You will begin to fulfill the Lord's will in your life, which is to become a mature believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Thank you for your patience uh, tonight. This concludes the third session on Christian maturity. Let's give God some praise. Yeah. I, ran a little, I ran a little over my time. I do appreciate your patience. There was a lot that we needed to talk about. We talked about the gospel message and we talked about the importance, the magnitude of what it means to submit. If you guys have any questions, I will stick around for a few minutes to answer those questions, but let us pray out. Uh, Father God, again, we thank you for tonight's lesson. We thank you for this opportunity to teach what it means to be a mature believer. Father God, we just pray that you will help us. Anyone that's here today, anyone that watches this, this teaching, this lesson online, Father, I just pray that you will enable them by the power of the Holy Spirit to just grow in their faith. And Father, we talked about a number of things today that could inspire that growth. And Father, I'm just praying that we will apply this word in our own life. Enable us, Father God, by the power of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to the gospel message, to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and to submit to the word that's prescribed in scripture, Lord. Help us to have a spiritual goal of becoming a mature believer help us to continue to go into strict training help us to submit to the discipleship process that will enable our growth and so father i thank you for everyone that's present here today i pray that you will reward them according to their faith in the name of jesus we pray amen amen, amen. god bless you all tonight